If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, what is the creepiest or scariest folklore story you have heard and what from culture slash region did it originate? Arang Minyak, the oily man in Malay. He's a shaman or a supernatural being entirely covered in tar or black oil. He gains and increases his powers by abducting and raping virgins. While I studied in Malaysia, a few girls were raped on our campus and somehow Arang Minyak was blamed. The rumor spread like fire. One weekend there was literally an exodus of students all in panic because most of them firmly believed we were being attacked by Orang Minyak. Most of the international students were just in disbelief. Wendigo, Wendigo, Wittiko, an Ojibwe myth to explain cannibalism despite bountiful food supplies. Stories tend to originate around people either committing cannibalism, or being forced to when lost in the forest. The latter has some story element involving hearing your name being called in the wind and water and creatures in the forest, and if you finally give it an answer, you've allowed the spirit of the Wendigo in. It was a law until the mid-20th century that anyone suspected of being possessed by a Wendigo should immediately be put to death or risk devouring the entire village slash town, or passing the spirit on to another host. Algernon Blackwood wrote the first fictional story with a Wendigo. It is one of the creepiest stories I've ever read, and was an influence on H.P. Lovecraft, among many others. It's a long read, but the build-up is fantastic. Two moments I particular caused me to not want to ever go camping alone. The stories come from all over the world, though it has its origin in Canada. Other countries with similar monsters, it has been discovered, have now been realized that these are the effects of rabies, and Kuru, a disease that you become infected with by eating the brain of an infected person. It was common in Papua New Guinea, do the consumption of bodies after death to release the spirit. This wasn't folklore but my friend's uncle told us a story that's creeped me out ever since I heard it. He's was telling us how he used to work a large farm in Mexico when he was younger and he had only been there for about two months. At one end of the farm was an older house with dark trees all around it and he noticed that the animals never went to that side and he would always see someone walking back and forth at the edge of the fence. Like they wanted in. One day the animals went to that side so he went over there too and he could see the person passing back and forth. As he got closer he noticed it was a woman because her hair was really long and dropped in front of her face. As he walked up to introduce himself her head shot up and she stared at him with completely black eyes. He said her face resembled a horse's because it was so long and disfigured. As he backed away she started to climb the fence and then chased him. She chased him all the way to his house which was about one mile away. He never went back to work. If you hear the scream of a livid woman who is determined to kill you, strip your outer layer of clothing where you stand and sprint because the mountain which will take your clothes as a tribute. Adirondack Mountains growing up. Turns out it was mountain lions. Way scarier than a witch. When I lived in an Australian outback town in the middle of nowhere our indigenous studies teacher, who is aboriginal, loved to tell us stories. She scared all the first graders straight by telling us never to go out into the desert alone, because there lives a monster who is always thirsty. He's always trying to find water, but never can because it hardly rains. So when plump and juicy children become lost in the desert, he jumps on them and drinks all their blood. All he leaves behind are the dry husks of children for their parents to find. I am sure she was just trying to deter us from wandering off into the bushland, but it left a memorable imprint. I've forgotten the monster's name. Another popular aboriginal tale is the Titilic. Titilic was a giant frog who drank all the water in the world. As the other creatures began to die from thirst, they plotted to make Titilic laugh. Everyone failed except Nabunum, the eel, who danced and tied himself into knots. Titilic laughed uproariously, releasing all the water and filling the rivers and lakes. Many of the creatures drowned in the process or were left stranded on new islands. The concept of a giant, laughing frog scared the cookies off me as a six-year-old. An English village near me has a large old mansion owned by a local family most of the rooms in the mansion haven't been touched for years, due to the size of the house, and the family refused to go into them, partly due to the fact that there's not enough people living in the house and partly due to hauntings. The house apparently dates back to before the English Civil War, and the family living there were a well-known Catholic family, so of course became a base for the king's soldiers, cavaliers I think they were called. The king lost the Civil War, and the family who live there say that they can hear the soldiers stomping around the hallways at night, and occasionally barking orders. They also claim there's a bunch of other ghosts, such as a veiled woman in black who only appears to you if you're ill in that house, a librarian who will shush people talking in the library room, yes it's that big a house, a young girl who you can only see through some of the frosted glass doors in the house, banging noises and screaming coming from the sitting room at night, and finally a man dressed in black who wanders the gardens at midday. 
And these are just the few tales I remember. Even if you don't believe in the ghosts there's still tons of creepy stuff about that house, such as tiny rooms hidden everywhere for priests to hide in, known as priest holes, a hidden room below the house that leads out to a nearby river, and hidden passageways all around the house. I'm from northern Brazil near the Amazon River. My grandma always told us the story of the Matita Pereira. At night you can hear her whistle. She is like a witch, if she finds you in the forest she gonna beat you with a leash that she has. The Matita Pereira is a normal human in daylight, she can be anyone from the village. It is like a curse. When you hear her whistle you can call her three times. You would scream Matita come drink coffee and the next morning she would visit you in her human form to drink coffee with you. So you could find out who she is. But there is a catch. She would come real early in the morning. You should have coffee and cigar for her, otherwise she would kill you. Everybody who would still be asleep when she arrives, would fall ill and die. It was really creepy for me growing up. But today I know that the whistle is a bird. In Brazil we have a lot of those folklore stories. Easily, the Yenald Lushi, or skinwalkers. It translates to roughly, by this way, they travel on four legs. It's one of the four witching ways, alongside the frenzy way, the wizardry way, and the sorcery way. The origins of the legend extend back in their legends to their emergence from the flood of the third world into the fourth world, or the world as we know it. Having left their creators behind in the flood and saved by the children of the ants, the Dinle, people, had lost much of the wisdom of how to live. They prayed for guidance, and did dances and performed ceremonies for guidance, and were answered by the holy people of the sky. These people had lived here before and were wise, and knew how to live in harmony with Mother Earth and Father Sky, and taught the Dinle, who were from the ground and called the ground people, the bright or shining ways, all of which eventually made up the Navajo way. Those who were blessed by the land and the gods were taught special ways for using medicine and magic for the good of the people. However, some of the holy people were jealous of some of the things being shared, and the things the Dinle brought from the worlds below, and taught some ways of corruption. Those were the ways of the Navajo witch, the most well-known being the witchery way, whose practitioners became Yinaldlushi. These were medicine men and women, who were also taught the witch to know how to guard the people against it, but fell to corruption. While medicine is still practiced in the reservations, so too, is the belief that witchcraft is as well, and while there are proud families of medicine men, there are also secret families of witches, passing down the witching ways through generations. Skinwalkers are told to be able to change form into any animal they desire, to suit their individual needs. They can run as fast as cars, and have been reputed to be strong enough to break stone. Looking in a skinwalker's eyes is supposed to paralyze you and inflict you with a sickness. Abductions if children and close family members of the Yinaldlushi are attributed to them, and some of the people say that a final ceremony to become one involves murdering a family member or close friend. This isn't folklore to them either. The Navajo take it deadly seriously, and generally refuse to talk about it to outsiders, probably because they don't want to be in attention on to themselves. Lizzie are basically forest protectors so basically the Slavic version of the Lorax. They kinda just hang out with animals them when to migrate. Lizzie can shapeshift into many different forms. As a human, he looks like a, a poor person with glowing eyes, and his shoes are on backwards. If you become friends with a Lizzie you can learn the secrets of magic. Farmers and shepherds would make packs with the Lezi to protect their crops and sheep. The Lezi likes to trick people just to mess with them. He likes to lure people into getting lost, make them sick, or the favorite of the Lezi, tickling them to death. They also hate axes and will go look for them and hide them in their lair. If a person gets lost in the woods and a Lezi crosses their path, you have to turn your clothes inside out and wear shoes on opposite feet. If not then the Lezi will tickle you to death. Lezi are very mischievous creatures, they have horrid screams, like a fish or cat, and can imitate voices of people to trick lost people in the forest. They use that lure them back to their caves, where a lezi will tickle them to death. They also remove signs from their posts just to make sure people get lost. Lezi aren't totally evil, although they enjoy misguiding humans and kidnapping young women. They love animals so they often keep grazing cattle from wandering too far into the forest and getting lost slash eaten. Sometimes cow herders will make deals with a lezi by handing him a cross and sharing communion with the lezi after Christian church gatherings. Those deals are said to give the cowherd special powers. This story from my babcha, grandmother, kept me out of forests as a kid. Being tickled to death sounds horrid. Scariest one I've heard in real life? The cave people. If you explore caves you've probably heard them. The quiet little whispers. They sound like a group talking way off in the impenetrable darkness. I've heard a dozen different versions of what they are. Lost souls, dwarves, evil spirits, 
or the logical explanation, drops of water echoing and your mind playing tricks. Either way, it's a common joke that we all carry three sources of light so that it never goes out. Because if it does, they'll come for you. Or it's because it's true darkness down there and you'll likely get lost and fall in a pit. It's a rite of passage for young cavers to be frightened with the stories by older vets. Though I've met a few who really swear to having full conversations with the specters. No matter how you shake it I'm a giant wimp and still don't like caving alone or getting too far from my group. Or turning my light out for more than a few minutes. My mom has a little cottage in the woods of northern Italy. It's a really comfy place but it has no electricity or warm water, so everything has to be heated up on a wood powered oven and the only light source is either external electricity, i.e. lamps with batteries. Not much of a problem really, it's great there and I love it. The thing is, there's only one small dirt road leading there and there is always something wrong with it. Every time we get there, some part of the road is damaged slash destroyed or not visible under an unreasonable amount of dead leaves, even if it's summer. When questioning the people in the next village, Rocca Sigilina Massa Carrera, cool name, I know, about it, most become really defensive and try to change the subject. We've gotten some information out of a few people though, and it scares me a bit, even though I don't believe in the supernatural, they believe there's a thing they call Ori, horror in the forest, trying to get people to lose sight of their tracks so it can have new playmates. The whole story is super interesting, but unbelievable. We figured that the damage to the road is due to wild hogs digging for food but we still can't find an explanation for the leaves being placed exactly onto the road. Oh well, I suppose it's just folklore, right? Our village has one called Bileas. What makes it creepy is that she isn't some obscure, unidentified being, people know women who are called Bileas, they have normal families and stuff. So she's literally living amongst you. She stalks people at night, that's when she's usually in a ghoulish form, feet turned backwards and shit. She gets sick a day before someone in the vicinity is about to die, and then becomes very healthy the day they do die. She can turn into different creatures and attack you while you're alone. Then you will fall sick and if she visits you in her human form while you're sick, you'll die. And you can't refuse her coming and sounds silly, and it is, but it is still creepy. And there's another one about music of the dead. Our traditional music has flutes and some forms of drums in it. It's said that people will often hear the music coming from the distance, but the flute will be missing. You're supposed to ignore it because that's the music of dead slash otherworldly beings. If you don't ignore it, then they'll notice you too. We have a lot of weird stuff like that, I guess people had to have good stories to keep themselves entertained. St. Petersburg, Florida. Where the truth is much darker than the legend. The mini lights have been an urban legend amongst the African American community here for a while. Around Childs Park and Booker Creek it is said that if any children are out past dark the mini lights, large green orbs of light would come out and kill them. The lights were said to be the sports of two dwarves that stayed behind with Minnie when P.T. Barnum and Bailey blew through town somewhere in the early 1900s. Now Minnie was the name of an old woman said to be a witch that somehow inherited the land despite being a newly freed slave. So understandably people were suspicious. Rumor has circulated that Minnie was a witch and had access to black magic, further alienating the old woman. It was said that Minnie never liked people poking around her property and often sent out her little men to chase off anyone who trespassed. And this continued every day until old Minnie's death. That was the legend. The truth is long ago, the Brooker Creek and Childs Park area had been home to many newly freed slaves after the war but just because a law passed didn't mean that everything was hunkedory. Hunting alligators was a pastime that netted big money for alligator skin, heads and meat especially during the growth of the tourism businesses in the early 1900s. But hunting alligators was no easy task. You had to have guns, hunting dogs, a kerosene lamp to find the gators as their eyes shone in the dark and of course threat. Goats, sheep and farm animals were used. Often tied at the bank of the rivers but they could get expensive. So sometimes hunters improvised and if they had little worth in fellow human beings. Then bait was plentiful. Raids into the African-American settlements were frequent. They waited until after dark and sent out their hounds looking to grab anyone they could drag off. The easiest being children. And so for generations children were warned to not be out past dark unless they would disappear. Nearly a hundred years later. The legend of Minnie's lights served to scare children back indoors to avoid being victims of hate crimes. But sometimes legends take on a life of their own for to this day people in those communities still claim to have seen the Minnie lights. Taylipo. American folk legend about a giant cat-like creature that stalks the woods at night. In the original legend, an old hermit hunter shoots it, misses, and instead ends up shooting its tail off. Taylipo is startled and manages to escape. Satisfied with the tail, 
the hunter takes it home to make stew out of it. Later that night Taylipo manages to break into his home. Taylipo jumps on the man's bed and asks where its Taylipo is. The man, scared shitless, answers that he ate it. Taylipo is enraged, and as an act of vengeance claws the man's stomach out and destroys his house to rubble. In some children's versions the hunter only loses his house, but most versions include a hunting dog that also dies in the scuffle. Other versions also have the legend last for a few days rather than one night, where the hunter is stalked by the creature every night, but the basic story is still the same. First time I heard it as a kid I was living in Alabama and it scared the absolute shit out of me since my grandma's house was right in front of a huge plot of woods. It's easy to imagine horror and folklore legends from other countries miles away, but the local stuff freaks me out. The drought of Norwegian folklore. Norway is a country that has a giant coastline, with cold seas and plenty of storms, so naturally one of our creepiest pieces of folklore would be based around it. The drought is the spirit of a sailor taken by storms. Their ships were shattered, and their bodies pulled beneath the waves, never to set foot on land again. Now they sail within the storm in their broken boats, bodies cold and bloated, covered in seaweed and barnacles. If you find your vessel trapped in a terrible storm you might see one, and if you do you will never set foot on land again. The drought will come out of the storm, grab hold of you, and drag you into your watery grave. I was reading a book on Finnish folklore and was surprised when the most brutal story was about tantas, gnomes, elves, hotel keepers. In modern world they're often described in an affectionate way but they used to be some malevolent creepers. People believed in tantas for a very long time, it was said they only really disappeared alongside electric lighting in households because there were no more dark corners for tantas to hide in. They were described as scary looking creatures, sometimes originating from the previous dead owners of the house. Tantas kept the house safe and thriving as long as you left them food and in this story the last session of sauna. You weren't supposed to go to sauna after midnight because that's when it's Tantas' turn. Well, there was a cheeky wench who gave a rat's ass about this rule and decided to go anyway. Everyone was telling her not to but she was stubborn. Time passes and there's no word of the wench, the people go to see if she's still in there but all that's left of her is her flayed skin hanging on a perch. Some traditionally creepier stuff are laikios who are the, the lost souls of children who have been buried and hidden in the woods after childbirth, no christening. They scared people by crying and screaming but sometimes they were helpful and pointed out trees that were about to fall. Sometimes they're described the same as vervatuli, willow-wisp and lure people deeper into bogs and forests. Painainen, also the Finnish word for nightmare, literally translated it would be something like the one who presses, Pena equals press, was a creature who sat on a sleeping person's chest, caused bad dreams and scared the bejesus out of them. Later it's been determined it was an explanation for sleep paralysis. On the big island of Hawaii there are the night marchers which are the ghosts of the cow warriors who died in a volcanic eruption after a battle. Their footprints are actually still preserved in Kilauea National Park. I've had a lot of people both locals and people from the mainland tell me of hearing a large group of men marching and chanting late at night around cow. You apparently smell sulfur and you have to get naked and lay on a fetal position. I've heard other people say you just can't look at them and if you do you'll die. I've had some friends tell me they were camping in a remote valley when they heard about 20 people march by speaking Hawaiian and they smelled sulfur they didn't see anyone since they were in a tent. Also had an old Hawaiian uncle tell me when he was a teenager working on a ranch at night he saw an purple light go from Kilauea to Moana Loa and the next day Moana Loa erupted for the first time in a while it was sometime in the 80s. This one I heard at Sapfest, harvesting maple sap, in northern Wisconsin. I'm not sure if it's well known since I only ever heard it from my family. It's called The Buried Boy, and it came out of this song we sing while at Sapfest. It's pretty much just singing about a guy sitting on the riverbank with his sweetheart while he talks about his older brother, who was murdered and buried by his dad. According to the story, the older brother rose up that night and killed his dad as payback. Except for, his eyes had already been eaten by birds, so he didn't see that his father was dead. So he kept wandering around, searching for his father in order to kill him. So he wanders around the woods, searching for his father in order to get revenge. He bangs on the doors and windows of log cabins, and if he finds it open, he'll come in and murder everyone. Also, if you pass by his grave, across the riverbank, in the song, he'll know and he'll stalk you through the trees. It doesn't seem as scary in a city, but when you got separated from everyone in the woods and the sun is setting, or when you're trying to sleep and the wind is banging against the door, it gets a lot scarier. I still don't like crossing rivers at night, even in a car over a bridge. I think I would go with the Rodenfänger von Hameln. It is a German tale. There is this man who comes into a town which is filled with rats. 
he offer the villagers his help. They take his offering and promise him a fair payment. So he walks around town playing flute. He plays it so well that every rat leaves its hiding spot to follow him. He walks out of town and brings the rats away. After this he returns, demanding his payment. The villagers are afraid of him and refuse to pay, they even try to force him away. He leaves before he gets harmed. One night when the moon was at its highest he came back and walked around town one more time, playing the flute. This time every child by the town comes outside to see him playing. The kids love his play so they follow him around. So this man wanders around until he has every single child in town in his tracks and he leaves. The next morning the parents wake to see every kid gone. No one could find them and no one heard of him anymore. Wales is full of stories of weird and wonderful shit. If you like dragons, magic and men dressed as women stealing babies for the changelings, you need to look into Welsh folklore and myths. My personal favorite and a story from where I grew up, Bobby Alar Y Soft. Or Baby Down the Shaft. They say that a woman who fell pregnant out of wedlock was forced into having the child in secret and made to take the newborn to the cave slash mines in the mountain. They left the child there to die in the caverns. After that the local people say they could hear the wails and cries of a baby echo through the village. The young mother, heartbroken and distraught, wandered the streets after the echoing cries in hopes that by some small miracle she could be reunited with the Bobby. She circumed to the cold of the winter night and died also. Now it's said that on particularly cold nights, you can hear a baby cry and if you wait long enough, you'll hear the young mother wail and sob in the wind too. The Santa Campana from Galicia in northwestern Spain is a procession of dead souls that roams the forest in winter nights. You can see their faint outlines in the fog and they are led by a living person carrying a lit candle to lead the way in a cauldron. This person has been cursed into leading them and will spend their nights roaming the countryside leading the dead until they die of exhaustion because they remember nothing when they wake up in their beds the morning after. The only way for a cursed person to lift his curse is to run into another living person and pass them the candle and cauldron. If you run into the Santa Campana there are a few things you can do to prevent being cursed, such as getting into a church, or drawing a circle around you with an olive tree branch. When I was a kid and went out for a walk late in the evening, my gran would remind me to grab an olive stalk and bring it with me in case I ran into them. Also the Madamas, evil spirits in the shape of an impossibly beautiful woman who live in caves underground protecting great treasures. If you go to a cave where a madama lives at dawn you can see her coming out with her comb to comb her long blonde hair. She will ask you to come with her and become her husband underground, but you must refuse, those who know the legend know that her beautiful comb is made of human bone. Some of the indigenous Australian dreaming tales are terrifying. My father told us of Kadija man. A man like the rest of us but righteous to the point that he has excess skills far better than the best of us. As a result of this power he is imbued with the position of punisher and healer. Some of his skills include leaving no tracks, being able to travel faster and better than the rest of us and being able to sing you to death. If you have chosen to do the wrong thing and maybe you're going to be punished with a spear through right thigh, he could also spear you anywhere with the knowledge of how to spear you with or without killing you. Now out of fear of the punishment you may think to yourself I will outrun him, he is just a man and I am just a man. So you leave careful to cover your marks and not leave a trail. You go for a day, through creeks and rivers over and around hills etc etc to evade him. The thing is every time you stop there he appears already standing there, not tired not thirsty and not hungry. Just waiting till you can't run anymore, you have to admit to yourself that you have to take the punishment just like you chose to do the wrong thing too. I was very frightened of Kadicha man when I was young and as a middle-aged woman now I still would not want him after me as there is no avoiding it. Here in Scotland, I was told about changelings as a little kid. The wee folk, fairies are nasty in Scottish stories, swap your baby with one of theirs so you feed and raise it for them. The baby will look just like yours so it's hard to tell. I heard to defeat them, you have to do something very strange, like prepare a dinner for everyone but in an eggshell, and act like nothing is off, or act like you're sweeping the floor but sweep dirt into the room from outside and act as though you're proud of your clean house. Then you leave the room and peek through, and if you hear the baby talking to itself out loud in an adult voice, wondering why you would do such an odd thing, you're to run into the room, grab the baby, and throw it in a body of water. Then the wee folk will run out to save it from drowning, and drop your baby in the rush, and you can get them back. I think this was a story to stop neglectful parents leaving their babies all by themselves for too long. England very old legend about a spirit called the Wild Hunt. Essentially it is a group of spirits led by the Reaper himself driving a large black carriage led by four black draft horses. They travel the English countryside seeking out lost souls or wanderers slash people that have lost their way. 
When they find someone the hunt begins with the culmination of a lost soul being captured and either conscripted into the hunt for eternity or dragged to the underworld. My story, when I was about 12 years old I had an intense passion for reading and learning all I could about ghosts and the paranormal. Every time I visited the library I would come home with at least three or four books on the subject. One night I had the most vivid dream I have ever experienced, also it was the last dream I ever had. Or at least I haven't been able to remember dreaming since and I am 42 years old now. Anyhow, in the dream I was riding in the back of a cab down a dark country road, right night, trees stretching over the road like a canopy. For some reason I knew I was in England. From USA, never been to England, yet, the cab approached a curve in the road beyond which there was a very unnatural light. We made the curve and there in the road was an old man with a lantern screaming turn back, turn back. I remember laughing and telling the driver to continue on around him which he did. As we passed him I watched the old man go by. As soon as the rear of the car got even with him he disappeared. A bit later in the dream we approached another curve. Again an unnatural light. Butterfly feeling in my gut telling me something wasn't right. We made the curve and this time in the middle of the road, forcing the cab to stop, was an enormous black carriage lit by four torches at the corners and led by four humongous black horses. The fog so thick at ground level I can't see their hooves. I was beginning to panic and looked out the window to the left. To my horror out of the fog was rising an army of the dead. Quickly I turned back to the driver and told him to get us the hell out of there. He turned to look back at me and was missing half of his face. Immediately I flung open the car door and jumped from the cab. The last thing I remember was a skeletal hand grabbed my shoulder. I woke with a scream stuck in my throat and drenched in sweat knowing that I had just died in my dream. The freaky part here is, I knew nothing of the wild hunt until a week later when I came across the story in one of the books I brought home from the library. Can't remember the title but it was a very old copy of a book on ghosts and legends from England. Still freaks me out. Strange also how I haven't been able to recall a dream since. Askong is pretty creepy. To summarize it, it's staying inside for 24 hours and heading out to the woods at 12 o'clock in the morning on January 1st to see what's going to happen this year. You must not talk to anyone, drink, or eat. You can't even look at anyone until you head out at 12 o'clock. Once you are out there, you have to go to a church to renounce your religion, pagans were converted to Catholics so they temporarily renounced Catholicism. Once you do this, you can now go try to see the future. The problem is that now you're exposed to supernatural forces capable of killing you or worse. These fun faces include the brook horse who drowns people and steals their souls, the Huldra who will make it so travelers never return by killing them or marrying them, and others who will try to distract you. You must not be scared either. Breaking any of these rules would come with dire consequences. You could go insane, be mutilated, or just disappear. The reward is pretty nice though. You get a pretty good glimpse of the future. You're alerted to marriage, war, fires, how well your crop will do, and most importantly, death. Many people did this to find out who would die in the coming year. During the walk, you could see new graves, visions through the keyhole of a church, and even a funeral procession. It's pretty cool and even if you don't see anything, you get a nice walk in the woods. I want to try it someday, maybe a couple years from now, because of how unique and unusual it seems. There's a place I visit when I spend time with my grandparents in Colombia. This place is called Puerto Colombia or Sabanilla to the locals, and to get there you need to hop on this tight, two-lane highway. My grandpa would tell my brothers and me stories about the region. My favorite was El Cuento de la Mujer de Blanco aka the tale of the woman in white. My grandpa tells of a time, a weekend in his youth, I believe he said his early 20s, and this was back in the mid-40s mind you, he needed to make a trip to Sabanilla to pick up supplies for his father's factory. He left in the morning, arrived at the pickup site and decided to stay for lunch and to catch up with the production folks on that end. On his drive back home however, he says are when this get topsy-turvy. He gets back on the highway at near the evening time. You can imagine how dark that highway is in the 1940s. He describes barely being able to see the road ahead of him, but as he rounded a bend shortly into his drive something he saw in his headlights caused him to freeze to the bone. Ahead of him he saw a woman standing on the side of the road. He says she was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen wearing a simple, white cloth dress that seemed to almost glow to him. He stopped his car next to her asked if she needs help. She doesn't say anything as she approaches the truck and attempts to open the door. My grandpa calmly opens the door to let her in, and she sits next to him. He describes a certain feeling of dread, because as a boy he had heard the stories too, and he needed to be very careful. He asks her pa donde, say no? Where to, miss? He says she spoke very softly, but enough for him to hear where she wanted to go. 
grandpa says she didn't say a word after that, she just kept staring at him silently. My grandpa knew the stories very well, and he was able to keep calm. He drops her off about 90 minutes later, and says the moment he pulled away and checked his mirrors, she was gone. Totally disappeared. La Mujer de Blanco, grandpa says the legend goes something like this. She presents herself to lone men that drive that highway at night. He's not sure if she's a ghost or demon. But. She has a simple request. Just a lift to a church. And you better take her. Because if not, if you try and get smart with her. Try and come on to her, or try and take advantage of her quiet disposition. Well, grandpa says it doesn't end well for the man. He says there have been dozens of cases where men have been found killed in their cars extremely violently on that highway. Many more people also report picking up this woman and taking her to the church at our town. The story I often hear is that she was on her way to get married, on that road before it was a highway to go to Sabanilla. And that on the way she was abducted by road pirates I'm not sure how to describe them in English. But they're essentially bandits that stalk roads and highways. She was supposedly killed horrifically, and that's why she exacts revenge on the unworthy men that come across her. The story has always fascinated me as kid, just wanted to share. And remember, take her to the church. This one only became creepy because of a coincidental experience I had related to it. There are legends of a creature called Black Shuck, or more generally, Hellhound. Most legends about it say that you will die a horrible death if you see it three times. Basically it's a large, black dog with glowing red eyes. I learned of this from an old Animal Planet show called Lost Tapes, which was basically Blair Witch Project but with cryptids. Several years ago on New Year's Eve, all the adults in the family dropped all the kids at off at our house so they could go down the street for an adults-only party. While most of my cousins were playing in my sister's room, myself and a couple others were out in the living room playing video games. At one point I hear my dog scratching at the door to come back inside, so I get up to let her in. She bolts past me into other end of the house, so I look back outside, figuring she got spooked by a raccoon or something. What I actually see is an enormous dog that was absolutely covered with long, dark hair walking around the back of the yard. This thing was easily twice the size of our dog, a golden retriever. Needless to say my cousins and I freaked the hell out and started yelling, which I guess spooked the huge dog as well, and it proceeded to leap over the fence in one bound. We were pretty shaken out of fear for my dog's safety, but thankfully she was unhurt, and I didn't really think much of the event. That is until I saw this dog a second time less than a week later while I was walking home from a friend's house late one night. Seeing it froze me in my tracks for a good minute. Thankfully it was far away and ended up wandering off in the opposite direction of my house. Roughly a month after this encounter, the Lost Tapes episode about Hellhounds premiered. Nobody ever figured out what happened to the dog, because we never saw it again after that. My parents have some pretty interesting ones. Both are Haitian and took place in Haiti. My father was never the type to believe paranormal stuff. He's not even religious. There's always stories about voodoo priests being able to hypnotize people, which he attributes to devil's breath. There was one night, however, that he has no explanation for. There was this house with some farmland behind it. He and his 17, yes, that many, brothers and sisters were told to never talk to the people inside. One night he was coming home from a party, had a buzz on and saw someone standing on the porch. Just out of politeness, he wished her a good evening. He was kind of offended that she didn't say anything back, but found himself staring into the farm in the back. He definitely saw a group of people working the grounds, and when one looked up at him, the person's eyes were red. My pop's older brother caught him staring and started frantically yelling at him to run. That's when he finally snapped out of his trance and hoofed it as well. He's tried many times to put the pieces together as to what would cause something like that, but never could. The one that really freaks me out is my mom's story. My uncle, her youngest brother, had a string of illnesses when he was really young. Maybe around three years old. One illness was so bad that my grandparents had to visit several hospitals. All of them couldn't pinpoint what was making him so ill. I guess he must have been nearing death for my family to consider getting a voodoo doctor. He had everyone in the house wear red, and the kids were separated from the room where my uncle was in. She doesn't remember much about the ritual but she distinctly remembers hearing a male voice from my uncle's room scream I'm leaving and that was it. He was completely fine afterward. He's so healthy now that at age 50, he looks like he's 30 lol. I don't know that this is folklore per se, but it's an old story and it gave me the willies. This may be a little inaccurate as it's been years since I read it. The story goes that this family living out in the mountains on a hunt, sees a pair of mountain lions and manages to shoot one of them. It's a handsome big animal so they decide to have it stuffed, 
but this being a rural area they don't have the best access to supplies and wind up using glass buttons for eyes. Maybe a week afterward, their farm comes under attack and the chickens start disappearing nightly. Nothing works. No bait, no traps, nothing they try has any success. Somebody finally sits up one night with a gun and sees that the culprit is a mountain lion. No amount of bullets seem to have any effect though, it goes right in, grabs a chicken, and runs back out unscathed. The frequent attacks really hit them hard and nothing they do about it works. It starts attacking during the day and scares the family. Finally the mother blames the menfolk for killing that big beautiful mountain lion, and thinks that its companion must be seeking revenge for its death. At her insistence they leave the stuffed cat outside. The next day, there isn't an attack, but when they go outside they see a pair of mountain lions standing together in the distance, at the edge of the woods. As the two cats vanish into the forest, the bigger one looks back at them briefly, and they see that it has glass buttons instead of eyes. In college, I had a Navajo roommate who told me about skinwalkers and some supposedly first-hand experiences he and his family had. So much of skinwalker stories you hear about online or on TV shows are just like ghost stories. Spooky tapping on your door and roof at night, trying to get you outside so the boogeyman can get you. They're evil spirits and witch doctors out to get you. The story he told was so much more personal and real sounding. According to his stories, skinwalkers do their thing against Navajo Christians who've forsaken their ancestors. They can put curses on you that can leave you suffering from mystery illnesses for months. They specifically wear furs of predator animals to turn into them which was taboo in the culture. This is all secondhand from 5 plus years ago, forgive me if my details are sketchy, the way you can tell a skinwalker from a normal person is that their eyes reflect like an animal's. To become one, you had to have that shamanistic magical knowledge, but then do something truly vile, for example necrophilia. Normally, you wouldn't talk about this stuff because they'd know and send curses your way, but he was on the east coast. Probably a safe enough distance, he figured. He had an anecdote where his brother would go to and from work down a trail in the woods, until he started to see bloody bear and wolf skins nailed to trees and hear whispers in the trees. They threatened to curse him and have him killed, trying to scare him off from using that path. He kept going down that path, reciting Christian prayers as he went each day until the skinwalkers were warded off. I've been over a lot of folklore over the years. Honestly, none of it really holds a candle to what humans actually do, but that's beside the point for this. There's an old Scottish legend about Glamis Castle. Supposedly in 1821, the Lord and Lady of Glamis had a son. According to the official record, the boy was called Thomas Lyon Bowes, master of Glamis and he died the day he was born. So far, all of this is provable and on record, and in fact, they were the great-grandparents of Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, more commonly known as Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, Queen Consort to King George VI of England. However, according to the legend, Thomas didn't die. He lived, but as he grew, he became more and more deformed, being described as half-frog half-man. His mental faculties seemed to be up for debate. Supposedly he was put into a secret room in the central tower, the door bricked up with only a way to pass food left open. This is actually more plausible than you might think because the castle is a 15th century fortification and in some places, that tower's walls are 16 feet thick. Some rumors say the room was originally a safe room or strong room. Allegedly, in the 1850s, when Thomas would have been somewhere between 29 to 39, when the next Earl's wife asked her guests to help her put things to rest once and for all. While her husband was out on a hunt. She had them all run from room to room, opening the windows and hanging something out of them, a towel, sheet, handkerchief, etc., to prove that they knew all the windows in the walls. Supposedly, there was a window, in some versions four windows, which, once they were done, remained closed, with no marker. The Earl returned before anything else could happen, berated his wife and promptly divorced her. The divorce is another fact that's on the record, she died in Italy years later. The interesting thing is that if this were true, then all the official descendants of the First Lord were usurpers. The monster was actually the legal heir, but he spent his life hidden in a room. There are also, some more fanciful versions which say that as well as being deformed, he was also somehow ageless or immortal, and that he still lives in that castle room to this day.